Talkish. I am Hallie Kester Jane. The Hallie Kester Jane Show is always available online at HallieKesterJane.com. Now, let's get to it. On episode 307, in honor of Women's History Month and International Women's Day, we are celebrating women. Joining me today on Talkish, the Hallie Kester Jane Show, is Emma Gray, a senior women's reporter at HuffPost and the author of A Girl's Guide to Joining the Resistance, a feminist handbook on fighting for good. And in our second half hour, a visit with acclaimed psychotherapist Susie Herrick, here to talk about her beautiful and unusual new book, Your Story is Your Power. Let's celebrate women. It's time for Talkish. We begin with Emma Gray and this. So the presidential election of 2016 happened. You cried. You ranted. You marched. You're Facebook's number one resistor. On Twitter, the opposition bots have singled you out. And now, a little more than a year after who you believe is that horrible man with the orange comb over took possession of the Oval Office with a little help from his comrades, you are, in a word, exhausted. How do you keep fighting the good fight? How do you fight and maintain a life? How do you get involved when maybe you're too far from the action? How do you contain your abject anger? Feeling all the emotions you are feeling, Emma Gray, a senior woman's reporter at HuffPost, put on her journalist hat and set out to get the answers to these questions in the hopes of providing a comprehensive guide for women everywhere, young and old, new feminists and seasoned protesters alike. For her book, Emma interviewed some of the most prominent thought leaders and activists of our time, including Women's March co-chair Carmen Perez, Senator Elizabeth Warren, and Black Lives Matter Network co-creator Alicia Garza, to find out the best way to listen, join in, and create sustainable action. It's time for Talkish. Let's talk with Emma Gray. All right, Emma, you talk. I'm going to listen because I got to tell you something. I'm exhausted. I'm kidding. I'm only kidding. Hear me. But I'm not kidding. You didn't hear my intro, but that's what I said. I said the resistance is near exhaustion. They're trying to keep up the good fight, keep their work lives going, their families taken care of, their love lives alive. A Girl's Guide to Joining the Resistance. This is a very, very timely and important book. Why did Emma Gray feel the need to write the book now? Were you feeling the stress and strain so many of the rest of us are going through right now? (laughs) Yes. I mean, I'm a journalist. I cover the intersection of gender and politics. And so I covered the 2016 election and I found myself on election night at the Javits Center covering the Clinton campaign. And instead of writing a story about, you know, our nation electing its first woman president, I spent the night interviewing grief stricken, angry, devastated and fearful people. And then a few months later, I covered the Women's March and I got to see firsthand what it looks like when that grief and fear and rage is channeled into civic action. And I just found that to be incredibly powerful. And we've seen this grassroots movement grow and morph over the last year and and go in so many different directions. I just wanted to synthesize the wisdom of women activists and politicians and provide something digestible for young women who might want to get involved but be exhausted and overwhelmed, as you said. Yeah, and you can see it. You can see it on social media uh, where not as many people are posting or I know I get tweets and and Facebook people saying, thank you for doing what you're doing. I wish every, I can't do it anymore. I'm exhausted, but thank you. No, they shouldn't be exhausted. There are a lot of fights though going on right now. I, I surely don't have to tell you that. that that's the resist. There's the, that resistance to Trump, of course, is, you know, the LBQTQ activism, Me Too movement, so many causes, so much to do. The book is in a way a call to arms. Um, what else is it? What else? What's, what was the whole point? It's, it's really a, a fun, uh, interesting handbook. Tell us why it's a handbook. Yeah, it's meant to offer some actionable advice. And as I said, digestible advice. It is so overwhelming. There are so many fights. And what I want young women and people of all genders in any age to understand is that it's about small actions creating a whole. It's not about 
I, one individual, must change the world overnight. Uh, it's, it's about, you know, doing what we can with the tools in front of us and also giving ourselves permission to step back sometimes and recharge. And that, that's it. I think that's a really important point. We'll discuss that in a minute as we go along. But, you know, you begin with Hillel the Elder's great quote, if not now, when? And you spoke to so many interesting women along the way for this uh, great resistors. Marlo Thomas from my generation. Well, she's a lot older than I am. Who am I kidding? But she's more my generation than yours. Elizabeth Warren, Carmen Perez, Alicia Garza. What was that like? For you to, to, to speak to so many fascinating uh, women uh, from, you know, before and during and now. Incredibly inspiring. And I wanted to make sure that while I was giving this book pieces of myself, that my story and advice was not what was centered here. I'm a journalist. What I can do is amplify other people's stories and go right to the sources and speak to the women who have been doing this work, in some cases, for decades. And I also wanted to include women who were coming at these issues from a variety of perspectives and from a variety of ages because I wanted to situate the activism we're seeing happening now among young people specifically, like what's happening in Parkland, uh, within a long history that this country has of young people leading the charge and being a driving force behind social movements. Of course, we saw it with Marlo Thomas and Gloria Steinem in the women's movement, we, we saw it with, um, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement. Every, every cause has its young people who are leading the charge, and then that energy just gets revived again and again and again. I'm glad that this book came out for another reason. Uh, it's personal in a way, uh, being one of the early women to, uh, to, to, to break the rules to say, no, we're not going to do this anymore. I could tell you stories that would make you laugh as much as probably Marlo and and, uh, the rest you spoke to uh, were my generation. But I was worried, honestly, that uh, the the first wave was getting knocked down a little bit. I remember when Gloria came, you know, stood up for a Hillary. People got a little enraged. Uh, So so I'm, I'm happy to see that we're all joining together, happier to see, of course, a new generation of, of young women and sisters uh, re- come together to, to move forward. And I think that is important. And I wonder, did Marlo or, uh, say anything to you about that? Was she worried uh, uh, as to what, um, what had occurred during the election and, and where we are now? She didn't mention that, but she did, you know, drive home the importance of listening to young people. And of course, spoke about her own work. And I think that we're, we all are better if we don't view ourselves in silos. Any movement is going to be building on the work of what's come before those people. So look at gun control. You know, young people in communities of color have been pushing for gun control for decades. Obviously, the Newtown parents did an incredible amount of activism after the Newtown shooting. And now these Parkland teens are able to do what they're doing because of that work that has come before them. And I think it's really important to acknowledge that when we're having these conversations. I do too. Uh, As a matter of fact, I just saw something on Twitter. Uh, They're attacking the kids now from Parkland. And I'm a Floridian not too far from there. Uh, and, and I'm devastated to watch what the right is doing to those kids. It's disgusting. It, it's a disgrace. And, and it, it gets into bullying. Another thing we need to protest against. I mean, right? But let's talk about this power of protest. Um, and I thank goodness that protest is back. To use it effectively, what do you think? I think to use it effectively, we need to be People need to be using, again, the tools that they have at their hands, which means social media, you know, Twitter, Instagram. That's how we can create something that reaches more than just the people who are out at any one given march. You can amplify your message now so much more easily. And to go back to Parkland, that is what we are seeing there. We see Emma Gonzalez give an impassioned speech at a rally where a couple hundred people are there but 100,000 and more people are watching it on YouTube. So we're really lucky to have those tools uh, so easily accessible right now. And, and I think that it's also helpful if a protest has a clear message. There is a reason that 
you know, the Women's March organization created a platform for the march. They stressed intersectionality. They laid out, you know, policy points. They laid out communities that they were there advocating for. And so I think between being pointed and amplifying the message, that's how we can be effective. Give us the definition of, uh, definition of intersectionality. I, I say that because, funny enough, somebody asked me what that was on, on Twitter the other day. Tell, tell me what, what intersectionality uh-huh. is. So intersectionality is simply acknowledging that the different identities that any one individual have impact the way that they experience the world. So as a woman, there are certain commonalities I have with other women, but I'm also a straight woman. I'm also a white woman. I'm also a cisgender woman. And so I have access to certain spaces that perhaps a trans woman or a black woman might not have access to. And if we are talking about building, you know, for instance, a feminist movement that speaks for women, we need to make that speak for all women, not just certain women. And acknowledging that is what intersectionality is all about. Your story matters. I I have been pitched so many uh, interviews with books or people who have your story matters. And I'm curious, you devote a whole chapter to it. Why, Why is it important in the context of this conversation? So it's so funny that that chapter was not even in the original outline for this book. But when I started speaking to the women that I interviewed for the book, almost every single one of them came back to that theme. And I thought, wow, this is important. I need, I need to stress this in the book. And, you know, we, we see the power of storytelling play out in the Me Too movement right now, which wasn't even happening when I wrote this book. Uh, So it's incredible how quickly things move, first of all. But also, you know, that movement is literally a movement full of storytelling. It's women standing up and saying, me too, and opening up the space for other women to say, me too. And that is having real impact. We are seeing certain very powerful men being held accountable for abuses. We are seeing really important conversations happening across industries in a way that in my lifetime, certainly, I've never seen before. So when you make an issue personal, it can resonate a lot more with other people who might not quite understand, why is this something I should care about? It's a lot harder to ignore someone who is standing in front of you and saying, this happened to me, and this is how it affected my life, and this is how these steps can be taken to make sure that doesn't happen to other people. You said powerful men uh, are are being held accountable, all but one. <laughs> right, not not all of them, not all of them. <laughs> Which you know, then my blood pressure goes up in my uh, and I can't breathe <laughs> and, and scream. And everybody I know gets to the same thing. I love this chapter title. Listen to me, I love this. How to stop watching Netflix? Get off your couch and get it done now. <laughs> 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 it is a fun book. We're sitting here having this intense conversation. Just want everybody to know how fun and how clever you put it together. But 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 that is something to talk about. You know, when you're so overwhelmed with so much, or or you just want to stop and watch Netflix. What you know? Talk to me. About well, that. and and I'm not gonna. I you know I'm not gonna poo poo Netflix. I think we all need a little bit of Netflix in our life because it's Must about be a balance. Of Post, Go ahead. but I personally can get into a dark hole where I'm just you know so overwhelmed that I don't know where to begin, and I think a lot of people feel that way. So what I wanted to stress is that you can take small steps. You can start local. We, you know, we need to pay more attention to our local politics, our state level politics, and you can commit to really small actions and just committing to, I'm going to call my representative on X issue that I feel passionately about twice a week and find a buddy who's going to hold you accountable and do that with them. Or you find, you know, one candidate for a school board or a city council that you like what they have to say and you go out and you canvas for them. You know, we don't have to change the world overnight. We just all need to be involved because a healthy political system exists when everyone is engaged with it. And I want to say this too. I want to talk local with you because that is something that's getting lost and I think is so important to this conversation. Not that you didn't deal with it. I'm just saying in general, we're, we're all into such big things. You know, where the world got so large with, with Twitter and Facebook and, and, and all the social, social media. You can go anywhere. 
But at home, right in your own backyard, is sometimes a very effective place to do what needs to get done. Agreed? Yes, I think it's really easy to focus solely on national news stories. I mean, I work at a national news organization, so I completely understand that. But so often, there are things that are happening you know, right in our neighborhoods that have a very real impact on people, you know, people's housing, people's access to health care, the education system, you know, what is the school in your area um, covering in terms of sexual education if we're talking about the Me Too movement and teaching consent at a young age. These are things that have really, really real impact on people. And it's also a lot easier to get access to your local elected officials than it is to, you know, reach the president. <laughs> right. Oh, boy. Except on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> no, I had to just uh, edit myself <laughs> what was best out of my mouth, but I did it. So you offer apps, websites, and guides that can help direct ad- activism. And I, I, so I wanted to make that point that if you pick up the book, A Girl's Guide to Joining the Resistance, a feminist handbook on fighting for good, you will find many tools and not just for uh, moving forward to, uh, to, get, to help you uh, direct your activism, but also to help you relax a little and, and do some other things along the way because it is a lot of fun. You know, there was a, there's a word in the book I just I hadn't heard it in so long. I was like, oh, everything is old as new again. Consciousness raising meetings. Talk to me. I love it. <laughs> we used to do it all the time. Talk to me. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, looking, that's what I mean about building on on the tactics that people used before us. Um, A friend of mine was on a TV show, actually, that was based in the 70s, and it was a feminist TV show. And so she played a character who was going to consciousness-raising meetings. And after the election, she invited a bunch of women over to her house for a consciousness raising meeting, you know, in 2017. And uh, it was kind of amazing. And people really came together and created actionable plans. And my friends ended up raising, you know, $15,000 for the last abortion clinic in Kentucky. And um, that came out of that consciousness raising meeting. So, you know, you get a bunch of people together in your living room and you don't know what you can make happen. Yeah, and and I like the whole thing about uh, groups coming to you know coming together uh, and and uh, and putting you know many heads together. And I think that's something, by the way, that that we need to be doing more of because I think one of the issues I know I find with me, you get so you know overwhelmed with just being on the darn computer and 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 you know doing your Facebook and and interacting that way that sometimes your personal life and your you know. Your, your 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 smaller life, uh, if you will, uh, in in on the local level gets uh, messed with, and I I think that's a big mistake. I think that's a, a very 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 big mistake. I I know it's something that I wanted. To, you called it a girl's guide, not a woman's <laughs> guide. You know I have to ask you about that. Um, it was just a conversational decision. It really, you know, I think I wanted to aim this book at young women and I wanted the title to be a little bit cheeky. And that was really all that was intended by it. You know, I still call myself a girl sometimes. Honey, I'm a so woman. <laughs> I'm a girl. Yeah, we're all girls. I'm just so I, I'm <laughs> Yeah. I don't know. I'm embracing it. I'm embracing my girlishness. And I think it's powerful. I do, too. And, you know, I kind of like uh, get annoyed. You know, when, you, when you're young, you just want to be a woman. And then you get, a, you know, you get up there and you say, now, wait a second. Like, I'm you know, a girl. <laughs> I'm a girl. You know, and there's nothing wrong with it. But I do think, by the way, that this book is just as apropos and, 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 and something boys a boy ought to pick up too. A couple of men I know ought to pick it up. <laughs> Might learn something. Yeah, I think a lot of the advice in there absolutely stands for men and boys as well. And I also just think it's so important to remember that when we expand our ideas of what being a woman looks like and mean, we also are expanding our ideas of what it means to be a man. And that is beneficial for everyone. Absolutely. I particularly like your advice, by the way, in the chapter, Fake News, Make News. <laughs> how, how to sort through all the BS. And there is a lot of BS out there, Emma. There's a lot. And, and I think one of the things that upsets me about the BS is how few people are absolutely discerning of what is and isn't. And that's what... Yeah. Talk to me. 
Yes. No, then that's what that chapter is meant to do. Just remind all of us to take a beat. It's very easy to, you know, absorb so much information on Twitter and Facebook and not and reshare something without even really taking the time to say, where is this coming from? Who wrote this? What website is this? If I've never heard of it, maybe I shouldn't share it. And I also think it's incredibly important to remember to diversify your news sources. Don't get all of your information just from one place. We need to be reading a diversity of publications and also taking the time to vet where we're getting our information from. And by the way, there's, uh, let me, let me uh, punctuate. Read more than the headlines, please. Yes. <laughs> so important. So important. Listen, there's a lot of work to do. Uh, so let's end where we began. Self-care, a.k.a. how to avoid losing your mind while you're changing the world. <laughs> you're a fun person who could write this stuff. How? <laughs> <laughs> By giving yourself permission to step back sometimes, to turn off your phone and turn off the news and log off of Facebook and Twitter and do the things that truly bring you joy and recharge your internal battery. You know, for some people that I spoke to, that was watching their favorite show on Netflix or taking a long bath or spending a night in with their family, um, going to yoga, going to therapy, really anything that helps you because it's exhausting to do any kind of activist work and we need to give ourselves permission to take a break sometimes because we are only human and that's okay. Last thing that I want to say, something that my mother used to say to me all the time, pick your fights. You can't take everybody on. Pick your fight. Agreed? Absolutely. Pick something that you feel deeply passionate about, especially if you're just getting into activism. And look at who's doing the work in that space already. You don't need to create something new. You don't need to change the world overnight. All you need to do is send an email or go on a website and figure out how can my money go X as far as it can? How can my time go as far as it can? Whatever tools I have, how can I offer that up to the people who are already doing the work? And you can just show up for them. Emma, terrific. Thank you so much. So nice talking to you. Okay. I've been speaking with Emma Gray, senior women's reporter, HuffPost, and the author of A Girl's Guide to Joining the Resistance, a feminist handbook on fighting for good. For more on her work, visit HuffPost and find Emma on Twitter and Instagram, where her handle is Emma Lady Rose. You are listening to Talkish, the Halle Caster Jane Show. My guests today are HuffPost's Emma Gray and psychotherapist and author Susie Herrick. Talkish with Hallie Caster Jane. Post new podcast Wednesdays, 3 p.m. Eastern at Hallicaster hyphen Jane dot com and via all of your favorite apps. And we're on Alexa too. Now, when people say to you, How would you describe yourself? you will answer, What? Whether we realize it or not, we define ourselves through stories. Understanding your own story is the key to understanding yourself your world, and your capacity to act within that world. And in the heart of your story, that is where you will find you, your voice, your power, and your truth. In a remarkable book, Your Story is Your Power, Free Your Feminine Voice, acclaimed psychotherapist Susie Herrick shows readers how to discover their story, how to use their story to cultivate their own power, and move forward both as an individual and as part of a strong female community seeking positive change. At a juncture where we need women's voices, women's intelligence, women's compassion, and women's courage to help us navigate the difficult issues that face humankind and the planet we call home, Herrick with humor, measured outrage, proven psychology, and hope for the future empowers women to seek out deep psychological truths in your story is your power. It's time for Talkish Let's Talk with Susie Herrick. Hi, Susie. This is Hallie. How are you? Hi, I'm great. How are you, Hallie? I'm just fine. I'm loving this book. I am loving this book. I'm loving this book. Before we even get started, I have oh. to tell you this. It's so beautifully packaged. 
the content is unbelievable, but the packaging is fantastic, and it's a gift book. And I just want every woman to know, if you have a best friend, this book is for her. So there you go. (laughs) Great. Okay. So there you have it. So, so, th- th- yeah, absolutely. So, your story is your power. Tell us your, a little bit of your story, Susie. Well, I'm, um, I've been a psychotherapist for almost 30 years, and I was, uh, realized and, uh, came to the realization that in order to really affect change, I have to, to change myself. And so, when I did that, and especially around, um, this idea of how we've dampened feminine te- intelligence. I learned that I was doing that myself, and uh, when I did that, and I had a, um, a learned voice that was very sexist um, or misogynistic, I learned to talk to that voice, and when I did, I had a, a major breakthrough with my relationship with my father that totally changed his life, which was the inspiration, really, for this work. Hmm, interesting. We all have myths, and we have meanings, and we have narrowed myth for all of us. And our story is changing. I mean, let, just let, look at, you know, take it to contemporary and what's been going on just in the last year. The Me Too movement times up. Uh, the Hollywood mm-hmm. pay gap is finally being addressed. That's where the world I came from. Your story is your power. Let me say this. Your, your previous interview, but we talked about this because this is a big movement with women now about your story is your power. Why is your mm-hmm. story your power? How is your story your power? How do you take your story and use its power? Talk to me. This is great. This is a great question. To start with, um, you'd want to look at stories and storytellers. Um, you know, we have a quote by Steve Jobs who says, "Tellers are probably the most powerful person," which is because they can shape the future. And stories are ways that, you know, from ancient times, you know, shamanistic um, to now, which is that we share information true story and and tell people how to behave and how to act and uh, you can just look at fairy tales for that alone Um, and so what happens is psychologically we all place ourselves internally in a story and we take on roles and we take on beliefs about ourselves and um, it's hard to become aware of what that is because it's so familiar to us and the only way that we can figure out that there's something wrong is if we can't move or we can't speak, you know, why that is. So what the book is about is taking a look at all of the things that impact our internal world, like the culture, like the families that we are raised in, and then also our personalities. And look at all those aspects of that kind of impact and how it staves off those important parts of us that we need to bring forth. And in this case, how it staves off the feminine voice. It's a phenomenal exercise, I have to tell you, just in just in playing with it. Because to me, it's boy now. It's it, it 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 it's 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 like something I want to carry with me wherever I go, and I have a minute and go in there and <laughs> and look at some of the things that are in there, and just you know, even if it's just ruminating on some of the wonderful quotes that are that are 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 in the book. But but the thing about it is this: I mean, from where I'm sitting, you know, a lot has certainly changed for women in my lifetime, and in many ways, a lot remains the same, though. And I know in the writing of this book, you wanted to confront the cultural narrative that a woman's worth can be measured by her beauty and submissiveness while also calling attention to how girls and women also feel held back by feelings of what they should do. That word should, don't you hate that word? I despise right. that word. Um, what they should do, be, or say. The thing is this. How, there, there's, how many in the world view and categ- categorize women? But, but it's also about how women see themselves. I'm, I'm going to cite something. It's a little long, and I don't normally do this in an sure. interview, but something came okay. to, to my attention not too long ago, during the election, actually. And I watched an interview with five women. They were from Texas, and they were five married women. Uh, 50, 45, 50, upper class, wealthy husbands. And their story and their perception was so clearly rooted in an old model. But that model is Uh far from dead. And I don't want to condemn or condone, but the thing that I pulled from that interview that I watched was this, that these women really had no voices of their own. Almost every word was couched Uh in my husband said this or... (laughs) Talk to me about Uh that old Uh Cinderella complex thing that I think is still something that a lot of women fight well, you know, it's, it's, um, there's a, 
what happens when people are living in a system, the system uh, is engineered to keep that in place. And, um, you know, it's not that we're, not that we're saying that, that having that kind of life is bad. It's just more of it's, if it's out of choice or a lack of awareness. Um, if those women felt like they can't, couldn't choose that life, but they had to have it, that would be a, a question that I would want to ask. And that's what I really want for the future generations is, you know, someone may choose to, to, to stay home with children, you know, but at the same time, they also may choose to be a scientist or whatever, but it's, it's out of choice. And so I'm, I think when you get to the center of you and start to look at the things that keep you from what you want, that's, that's where you go to look at what those blocks are. That's where you find where the culture has stayed people off. And in those cases, you know, I'd, I'd be curious about what their story is and why they choose to speak that way. Like my husband said this, because generally in the past, women, you know, if you look back in history, women have been the pretty first of their father and then of a husband and then of a son. And if they don't have any of the, didn't have any of those, then they were considered outcasts of society. So it's an old, old patriarchal paradigm that women are basically not, you know, individuals. They're pretty much owned. And it's archetypal. It gets into the culture and it stays there. So, um, and I noticed this once when I got divorced about how I was treated differently after I was divorced. I live in a very conscious area. So these things are just insidious and old, and it's bringing this to consciousness and being on this learning curve of how do we free up parts of ourselves that we have not looked at, and that's specifically the feminine voice. You know, this, um, this is sexism and misogyny are the oldest world prejudice. You know, and it's interesting about this, too, and I was kind of getting there in the, in the, in the previous uh, question before I went further, and that is this, that we also, I think, have to look at not just how women see themselves or what their own stories are, but how they see other women and what they demand of other women. I, I think women in yes. what are, are, are different than men, and I think that women can be very demanding upon each other and expect from each other things that maybe uh, male uh, friendships don't require or relationships to other men require. Uh, maybe the, the, the men, it's because the good old boys network is kind of silent. <laughs> and women, I think, mm. are not so silent. I think we, we let it out uh, to each other more than we let it out maybe even to ourselves. And, and, and I do want to address that. Are, are, can women be friends? Can, can our stories... Uh, um, bind us, or do our stories separate us? Talk to me. I think naturally women, you know, in science we find that naturally women collect together under stress. So it's actually natural for women to build relationships amongst themselves. It's, it's an odd cultural meme right now that's, that women are actually catfighting because I think it's, a, it's a, something that's come out in the media because it's considered sexy, Right. But actually, women are not naturally that way, and so I think if women are expressing that part of it, you know, in that way, it's really out of out of from the media. Um, and generally, women uh, are relationally intelligent and and lean into relationship and want relationship and and like to work things out. So um, I think it's really a matter of how to take a look at what the culture is feeding us and how women are in training to that, as opposed to what, the way they are naturally. Mm, I think that's a great point. Well said. Your story is your power empowers women to seek out deep soul truths and use those truths to live a more confident, unapologetic, love that word, life, uh, mm-hmm. while creating a brighter mm-hmm. tomorrow for all. It, it seems that for many women seeking those deep psychological truths is just some place they choose not to go. Gloria Steinem, and you, this comes from the book, guys, said the truth will set mm-hmm. you free, but first it will piss you off. Yeah, <laughs> I, I love that. It's yeah. so true. It's what's so true. So to, to women who are afraid of being pissed off, what do you say? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I'm a therapist, so I really believe in emotion and looking into emotion and, and uh, anger is a great emotion because it tells us one of two things or two things, which is something's wrong and something has to change. And I think that when you learn the truth and you feel pissed off, it's a sign that you're awake. And then the idea is how to affect change and what's the best way to do it. Is there a best way to do it? <laughs> well, in, in this book, <laughs> and I think there is, which is that in this book, it's, it's how, first you've got to work internally. Like, how am I keeping myself from me? I know that part of this is that I had to do this work myself, and so I, I'm really an advocate of it. Um, but how, how have I 
you know, put myself down and how have I told myself I can't speak to what I want. For years, I never liked watching violence on TV and I felt like, oh, I had to, right, because it's part of the culture. And I thought, I don't like this. And so I realized I don't have to do that. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, And there's certain things that, you know, I found that, you know, like I always felt ashamed for wanting a relationship. And I realized, like, no, that's a, that's, a, that's a very intelligent thing to want because we evolve via relationship. We mature, we grow, we, we get better when we have good relationships. And so um, all these things inside of me that I thought were stupid or wrong actually were counter. They're actually good. And um, so that's why this book is so important is what intelligences are we missing out from, from people that don't get a, a word in edgewise? I want to talk to you also about compassion. I think that this country okay. is a world, has turned into a world lacking compassion. I always put compassion with women. I don't know why. I don't think that's necessarily true. I think that both sexes are very capable of it. But I do think that we all are so busy with our lives or so caught up in our own you know, ideologies and this, that, and the other thing that compassion's been kind of lost in the mix. Um, it's, mm. a, it's out of vogue, if you will, even a way. And the bean counters have taken over our narrative, by the way, too, which has a lot to do with that bottom line and that lack of compassion. Talk to me about compassion um, and why we women need to nurture compassion in society uh, and why we fit that narrative so beautifully, because I think it's true. We do. You may disagree. I don't think so. Well, you know, compassion is a, it's a very interesting topic, and I know that at Stanford University they're doing a lot of work uh, around compassion, and there's, you know, it's a matter of definition of what compassion is, um, which is the hard one. Um, but my sense is it's definitely a, a something that humans are naturally capable of doing, is being compassionate because we're social creatures. We, we, um, we have to have each other in order to, to survive and live and thrive. And so compassion is a big component of that, to be able to see and feel like what it's like to be somebody else and to really, you know, have an understanding of pain and be able to be there and hold a space for people when they're in pain. Um, And so, you know, this is one of the things that, you know, um, the research around oxytocin is the women excrete oxytocin when they are under stress. And so they tend to collect together and have compassion for each other. Um, So it's, it's one of those things that I think that why we wrote this book is that, you know, people often poo-poo things like compassion because it makes them more like a girl or whatever. And that's actually counter to what we need for our survival. We need to have good relationships and learn how to work with each other and learn how to, you know, learn how to pick up on the emotions of other people so that we can, you know, learn how to relate to each other better. I, I said I see it as a lack of compassion for for our fellow human beings. What 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 do you think is 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 wrong here? With compassion? With no. With, I think with how we relate said, to each other the, these days. Say say again. Sorry. With, oh, it's okay. With with how we relate to each other these days, and and the fact that everybody's so combative and uh, um, you know hard line mm. and and uh, not being able to to find that middle ground amongst us all each other. What what do you think's going on? Well, I think that, you know, um, that our culture was, you know, the American culture is really built on this idea of the rugged individualist, which is, you know, sort of like, you know, the the main hero is the guy that can do it on his own. Um, And in a way, it is a myth. Um, And because in that, that rugged individualism, we didn't look at the externalities of that kind of behavior. And so right now, there are areas in our, in our world that are really suffering from that. And women suffer from that a lot because, um, men are generally seen to be these, you know, rugged individualists, and they don't have to care about the externalities of their behavior. Like corporations, for example, environmentally didn't have to worry about the externalities of what they were doing. Um, and so, in terms of of that, we've we've poo pooed this idea of it's good to have good relationships because I have to be independent and I can't rely on any. I don't have to rely on anybody, but actually. In order to do anything, we have to rely on a lot of people. I mean, you get on the road, on the, on the freeway, and you have to rely on everybody to be able to drive a certain way. <laughs> There's no individualism in that, right? <laughs> right. So um, we have to dispel the myth of the rugged individualist and look at more of, you know, how do we come as a, a what I would say, a mutualist, right? <laughs> the cooperative mutualist. How do we come together so that we can, as a species, survive? We're really in a, you know, environmentally, we're really in a tough time. Um, so we need to bring this part of us out now. 
The book, as I said before, is so beautiful. Every page is an adventure, truly, uh, whether it's a brilliant quote, an mm. idea, an explanation, an answer. It is, it's is—it's—it's a workbook, too, that teaches us how to use creative astute exercises to uncover cultural family and personal motivations and help the reader begin to gain that self-awareness that, that you and I have been talking about for the last few minutes uh, and to recognize patterns in life. I have a question. Is it ever too late sure. to do a little exploration? Oh, never too late, ever, ever. In fact, you know, um, the older you get, the better. Um, there's, you know, the the mind is neuro, you know, the brain is neuroplastic throughout the lifetime. So you can't, the old adage of you can't teach a do- old dog new tricks is not true. It's actually quite the opposite. And um, and that actually for people when they get older, it's it's recommended that they do autobiographical work so that they can take a look at their lives. Um, also with parents, it's really important because they can get a sense of how to look at the disparate parts of themselves and and have what they call coherent narratives so that children can relate to them better. Um, So this is all current research that's coming out, um, and it really shows that we are relational creatures and it's important to become relationally intelligent. I want to get back to the changes that are happening in the women's, with the Women's March. It's so reflective of, of the changes that are happening in women's lives. For those women who want to tap into that wave of women becoming empowered in their own lives and, and, and sharing uh, you know, all of our deeply personal stories, but aren't quite sure how or fear, because I think fear is a lot uh, in this game, breaking out yeah. of their own limitations, you say what? Well, I, I put out a call to women to bring out um, their voice and be brave. Because the more that they bring out what they see, the more that we get intelligent, the more that the collective intelligence builds. And I, and I also would say that about men, um, that, you know, in support of this and also, you know, their own internal feminine, how do they bring that out and not let someone put them down for it? Not let, the, you know, the word, you know, you're a girl be an insult um, because that's the way it's been. But now it's like if you're being told you're a girl, that's a good thing. Um, because it's saying something about you that's quite evolved. And so I would say that this is what we need now. We've got to stop putting down the feminine and stop insulting it and seeing how much it has to add to our collective intelligence to have to survive as a species. I want to close with this. Uh, I talked about it with Emma Gray, who was in the first half of uh, this hour, and, and she wrote this book, which you don't know, A Got- Girl's Guide to Joining the Resistance. Mm. A feminist handbook. For oh yeah, I've heard of it. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a terrific yeah. book, also. But we, what she and I talked about was exhaustion. <laughs> Women are exhausted. Yeah, we're, we, you know, we've 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 got our causes, we've got our families, we've got our work, we've got our this, we've got our that. You know, and it's like we don't even give our permission to ourselves to sit down with a terrific book such as yours and take the time to to to, to examine. What do you say to women so that they stop being exhausted? and put themselves first? Because I don't think you can take care of anybody else unless you take care of you first. What are your thoughts? Yeah, my hat has off to the airlines because <laughs> they're the one that said, put your oxygen mask on first, <laughs> which I love. Um, and uh, I would say that, you know, one of the things that I have found that the world does not benefit from overtired women. And how do you take care of yourself so that you're not overtired? And one of the things, the reason we wrote this book is that when you get into that moment of silence, where you actually can hear parts of you. It's actually really generative. And I remember that old commercial, you know, Calgon, take me away, and the woman goes, you know, closes the bathroom door and goes and has a bubble bath. I don't know if you remember right, that old commercial. Sure do, yeah. Um, yeah, it's that kind of thing, which is that, you know, if we can model how to take care of ourselves, and because we're so trained out of that, right? We're so trained not to, to take care of ourselves, but put everyone first that we become codependent and um, and that codependence is really about not allowing someone else to experience the natural consequences of their behavior, right? Because we, we make up for it. And so this idea is that how do we, you know, step forward and say, I need to take care of myself and you need to take care of yourself and I'm going to take some time out if you can. Now, some women can't afford to do that and um, so there have to be other ways. But right now, if you can, I would highly recommend it and give yourself time and make time because there's so much that goes on in our culture about what to do. But this is one of the most, I think one of the biggest priorities is how to heal yourself and, and hear yourself. Thank you. What a great book, Susie. Love this book. Appreciate it. Thank you. I've been speaking with Susie Herrick, licensed psychotherapist, 
mediator, trainer, teacher, consultant, and writer. With co-author L. Luna, they have written both a beautiful and powerful book, Your Story is Your Power, Free Your Feminine Voice. For more information on Susie and the book, visit susieherrick.com. Thank you so much for tuning in to Talkish, the Hallie Caster Jane Show, a production of Resec LLC. Be sure to tune in to Talkish Wednesdays, 3 p.m. Eastern, when new podcasts are posted at HallieCasterJane.com and on all your favorite apps, including your Alexa. We're open 24-7. So, until next time, when we meet again, this is Hallie Caster Jane.